Good evening and welcome to the Redwood Library in Athenaeum. I'm uh, Patricia Pettit, the uh, communications officer here at the Redwood, and we're delighted to have you with us. And we're especially happy that Dr. Edward Marquard is continuing his music appreciation series. Tonight is part two of Between the Wars. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Marquard. Thank you, Patricia. It's great to be back. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a beautiful day outside, and I'm grateful to you for staying in. <clears throat> this evening, we're going to continue our presentation of composers between the wars. That's World War I and World War II. Time permitting, we may go a bit beyond World War II into 1945 and 1946. Uh, we're talking about composers in Germany at this time. And we're also going to talk about several composers of the four I hope to get to three emigrated to the United States when Hitler came to power. We're going to start in the Weimar Republic, which lasted roughly from 1918, the end of World War I, Hello to 1933. Okay, so he's on and he's doing and then, fine. And I can hear you, Patricia. I did a short intro. Patricia, I can hear you. And we're going to move then to the Third Reich, which was from 1933 to 1940. All because the first assembly of the government after World War I took place in Weimar, a city in South Central Germany. And it was home at one time to both Goethe and Schiller. What this government wanted to do was to have universal suffrage for women and men, civil liberties, social welfare, and all within a democratic framework. From 1918 until roughly 1923, this government was filled with political extremism. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, <clears throat> and contentious relations with World War I, the World War I victors. In 1924, the reparations contract with the victors was renegotiated and aided by U.S. investment, the economy improved and achieved relative stability from 1924 to 1929. Fashion, art and music and government subsidized ticket prices all contributed to the success of this time. Composers wrote in a multitude of styles but mostly were leaning toward writing in accessible styles, much as the French were, Les Six or the Six in Paris in France, <clears throat> were doing at the same time. Early on, all kinds of music thrived, including Schoenberg and his 12-tone or serial, uh, serial compositions, as well as composers who wrote for the working class and composed left-wing radical songs. This all came to an end in 1929 with the stock market crash. Obviously, it ended United States investments. Mass unemployment occurred, a shrinking economy and falling tax revenue and cuts in benefits and services were the, the word of the day. Into this breach arose the National Socialist Party, which won a plurality in 1932, backed by President Hindenburg, Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor by Hindenburg in 1933 and assumed unlimited power at Hindenburg's death in 1934, establishing the Third Reich or the Third Empire, which the Nazis viewed as successor to the Holy Roman Empire and the German empires under the Kaisers. Let us go back to the Weimar Republic and talk about the music of the time. A phrase Neue Sachlichkeit, or new realism, new objectivity, or a new matter of factness took, factness took hold. And it opposed complexity and promoted uh, familiar elements such as popular music, jazz, and the like. It also used Baroque and classical techniques or procedures. Music should be objective in its expression and music as an autonomous entity, i.e. sonatas, concertos, symphonies, were rejected. And this especially was true when the Nazis came to power. And as we shall see in our next meeting, it was much worse even in the Soviet 
Union. When the Nazis came to power, the word of the day was to attack modern music as decadent or degenerate. Early on, one of our first composers is Ernest Krenick, who was a Czech composer who lived in Vienna. The first piece we're going to examine is Johnny spielt auf, or Johnny plays on. Usually it's translated in English or the English version is Johnny strikes up the band. It premiered in 1927 during the so-called golden age of the Weimar Republic. It's an opera. It drew on jazz, simplified harmonic language, again, like Les Six or the Six, and again, it used classical and Baroque procedures. It was attacked by the Nazis as degenerate. It had African-American elements in it. The plot or the synopsis, the overriding thing that it tries to project is an interaction between a European composer representing the old style and an African-American jazz musician who represents the energetic new American style. I'm just going to play a bit of the first part of this. It opens in a hotel room in Paris. So there's what the style is, and we're going to run across that in ensuing pieces of art or art music as well. Uh, Krennic, as I mentioned, emigrated to the United States in 1938. His music was considered degenerate by the Nazis. He was labeled Jew, but he was not one. It was an excuse for the Nazis to come down hard on him. And after he emigrated to the United States, he dispatched this uh, method of writing, sort of contemporary modern pop music influenced, and took up the, the cause of Schoenberg and his 12 tone style. The next composer, I'm sure you've heard at least some of his music, is Kurt Weill, W E I L L, who lived from 1900 to 1950. He was an opera composer in Berlin. And he was an exponent of this new objectivity, the Neue Sachlichkeit. The opera which put him on the map was Aufstieg und Fall der Stadt Mahagoni, The Rise and Fall of the City of Mahagoni, which premiered in 1930. He collaborated with the playwright Bertolt Brecht, and it's an allegorical opera which takes a stab at capitalism. The premise is that a group of people found the city of Mahagoni and it is operated without any morals or legal laws. In other words, they establish a paradise. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out so well and it becomes a hell rather than a par uh, paradise. These fugitives from justice build a town then dedicated to pleasure. I'm going to play the most famous song from this work. It's called the Alabama Song. It's the one song in this opera, which is in English. No one has been able to figure out why Brecht and Weil wrote an Alabama song in English to be put in the middle of a German opera. You will hear it sung by Jenny, who is a prostitute and the chorus is made up of her compatriots in that business. And it's got a lot of angst and urgency. And originally it was sung by Kurt Weill's wife, Lotta Lenya. The Alabama song from the rise and fall of the city of Mahagandhi. Oh, 
show us the way to the next whiskey bar. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, don't ask why. For we must find the next whiskey bar. For if we don't find the next whiskey bar, I tell you we must die. I tell you we must die. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you we must die. There's a parody of American popular songs at the time as well. Uh, and as you can tell, it's a satire in both music and libretto. Keep in mind that Bertolt Brecht was a communist, therefore had very bad things to say about capitalism, uh, which this is poking fun at, this entire opera. The next work that is in the canon, really, of operas in this country and in Germany is the Three Penny Opera, the Dry Groschen Oper, premiered in 1928. Again, it's a collaboration with Bertolt Brecht. It's based on John Gay's libretto from the Beggar's Opera, which you may remember is the largest single push that was given to Handel to get out of the opera business and write oratorios in 18th century England. Again, the Beggar's Opera was designed so that people who didn't have a lot of money could attend the opera, which was not the case at Handel's operas, which were, of course, in Italian to start with and only uh, allowed wealthy patrons to attend. The music here, again, parodies hit songs of American. Um, one became a big American hit. I'm sure you'll recognize it. He juxtaposes 18th century ballad texts, European dance music, and American jazz. The most famous song from this opera is known as the Ballad of Mac the Knife, sung variously by Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, and of course, Bobby Darren. The real title is not the ballad of Mac the Knife, but De Moritat von Mackie Messer, meaning the morality of Mackie the Knife. The lilting melody that we're all familiar with undercuts the brutal imagery with sort of an easy charm. The accompaniment is rather simple, it starts out with a barrel organ or a harmonium and gradually builds in size to bring the story to the present day. The present day, of course, being 1928. And the song, as you may remember, lists the murderous deeds of Mackie Messer. I think in the Bobby Darren version, it's a little bit sweetened and we don't get the real kick that we're going to find uh, in this particular version uh, by this particular artist. Brecht wrote, if you're familiar with his plays, such as The Chalk Garden, um, Brecht wrote to shock, to jolt, and to confuse audiences. And certainly he found a willing partner in Kurt Weil. Here is the prologue and the overture, which I think you'll find 
portends something really sinister to come. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Baroque forms were used and the fugue most of the time, and it's, there's no, uh, there is a fugue right here in the overture, albeit a brief one. Here's the prologue, the overture, and then the ballad of Mac the Knife. You are about to hear an opera for beggars. Since this opera was conceived with a splendor only a beggar could imagine, and since it had to be so cheap, even a beggar could afford it, it is called the Three Penny Opera. <laughs> So I, I think you can hear the style. Again, it's it's like Milo in Paris, writing for smaller instruments. You may remember Oniger and his great oratorio, King David, with a hundred amateur singers and a very small orchestra of 17 players and only two strings in that orchestra. In this case, in the staging of the Three Penny Opera by Kurt Weill and Bertolt Brecht, it is usually Usually the, the band or the orchestra is part of the action and is on the stage. The words that we're going to hear are in a translation, and it's the most popular translation into English, by Mark Blitzstein. In the, the, the um, Three Penny Opera ran for two years in Berlin, and within, it, within its first five years of production, it had 5,000 performances in 19 languages. And here, as we know from television and movies, the idea is to put up the underworld or the, the uh, thievery element, the murderous element of society and put down the power structure. Again, keep in mind that Brecht was a communist and I think this infiltrates his, his view on life. The lyrics here are, Oh, the shark has pretty teeth, dear, and he shows them pearly white. Just the jackknife has McHeath, dear, and he keeps it out of sight. When the shark bites with his teeth, dear, scarlet billows start to spread. Fancy gloves, though, wears McHeath, dear, so there's not a trace of red. On the sidewalk, Sunday morning, lies a body oozing life. Someone sneaking round the corner is that someone Mac the knife. He creates a disturbing sense of sympathy with the criminal underclass and he glamorizes the mob, as I said, and points a finger at the power structure. In 1933, five years after the composition of this really great work, it was of course banned by the Nazis as decadent. Here's the ballad of Mac the Knife. Oh, the shark has pretty teeth, dear. I should say, despite Ella Fitzgerald and Bobby Darren's wonderful renditions of this, it's not supposed to sound pretty. And he shows them early white. 
Just a jackknife has my key here, and he keeps it out of sight. When the shark bites with his teeth, dear, scarlet billows start to spread. Fancy gloves, though, where's my key here? So there's not a trace of red on the sidewalk. Sunday morning, rise a body, losing life. Someone sneaking round the corner is the someone at the knife. From a tugboat by the river, a cement bag's dropping down. The cement's just for the weight here that your Mackie's back in town. Louis Miller disappeared, dear, after drawing out his cash. And Mackie spends like a sailor. Did our boy do something rash? Suki Tawdry, Jenny Diver, Polly Peachum, Lucy Brown. All the line forms on the right. Now that Mackie's back in town. And so it goes. You mentioned, or you may have heard mentioned the list of women in Mackie's life. One of them is Jenny, Jenny Diver, the pirate Jenny, originally sung by Lottie Lania, who was Vile's wife, as we pointed out. In the next song, Pirate Jenny, Jenny is, of course, in this opera as well as the rise and fall of the city of Mahagoni, is a, um, a prostitute. She describes a miserable existence as the maid of a cheap hotel and describes a fantastic future in which a pirate ship turns up in the front of the city because of her and all who have despised her are killed by the pirates at her behest. You gentlemen better watch while I'm scrubbing the floors and I'm scrubbing the floors while you're gawking. And maybe once you tip men, it makes you feel swell on a ratty waterfront in a ratty old hotel and you never guess to who you are talking. You never guess to who you are talking. Suddenly one night there's a scream in the night and you wonder what could that have been? And you see me kind of grinning while I'm scrubbing. And you wonder what she got to grin. And a ship, a black freighter, with a skull on its mast, will be coming in. I think you get the idea of the style of music that Kurt Weill was writing, and it has a real sinister edge to it. He uses dissonance only occasionally, but when he does, it's pointed and has a great reason for using it. I'd like to play just uh, one more song. It's very short, so we'll listen to the whole thing. It's called The Useless Song also from the Three Penny Opera. If first you don't succeed, then try and try again. And if you don't succeed again, just try and try and try. Useless, it's useless. Our kind of life's too tough. Take it from me, it's useless. Trying ain't enough. 
Since people ain't much good, just hit them on the hood. But though you hit them good and hard, they're never out for good. Useless, it's useless, even when you're playing rough. Take it from me, it's useless, you're never rough enough. I don't know why, I just really like that song. Um, Court Vile then moved to New York uh, in 1938 and had a second career as a very, very successful composer in the musical theater. Among his hits were Knickerbocker, Ho Knickerbocker Holiday, uh, Lady in the Dark, and Lost in the Stars. I want to play just a little bit of Lost in the Stars. Uncle Stephen, why will Absalom not come home? Because he's lost. Because we are all lost. But Uncle Stephen, you are Umfundis, and you can ask God to help you, and he will surely help you. I don't know, Alex. If Lord God made the sea and the land, he held all the stars in the of his hand, and they ran through his fingers like grains of sand. And one little star fell on gold. And the Lord God hunted through the wide night air for the little dark star on the wind down there. And he stated and promised he takes special care so it wouldn't get lost again. As you can tell, Court Vile adapted nicely to what we think of as Broadway or musical theater kinds of, of music. I think it's a beautiful piece and there is no sinister part to the music in this show. The show itself, Lost in the Stars, is, the subject matter is apartheid in South Africa. We move along to our next composer and probably the biggest name uh, of the ones we're going to talk about tonight and it's Paul Hindemith. Uh, Hindemith lived from 1895 until 1963. He is among the most prolific composers of the 20th century. He was an important teacher of at least two generations of composers. He was a wonderful teacher and a theorist. He taught first at the Berlin School of Music from 1927 to 1937, at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut from 1940 to 1953 and the University of Zurich from 1951 until 1957. Hinnebut thought of himself primarily as a practicing musician. He performed professionally as a violinist, a violist, and a conductor. And through his career, he taught himself to play virtually every instrument in the orchestra and played them well. There are some who think that he may have limited his compositional chops because he limited his composing to only what he could play on the various instruments and not stretch the instruments. He also was very important and he composed a lot of music for amateurs. Um, and the experience of performing to him became central to his compositional style. He wanted his music to be performed. He didn't write it for the desk drawer or for historical purposes, he wanted it performed. He adopted the aesthetic of the new objectivity that we talked about a little bit earlier. All his music was neo-tonal. By that, I mean, there was a pitch center. You can find out where you're going. It sometimes is unexpected, but certainly in opposition to the atonality and the 12-tone music of Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern. In the late 1920s, he wrote what was known as Gebrauchmusik, usable music or music for use. His goal was to create music for young or amateur performers while still giving them a high quality piece of music, but one 
that was within their talents and abilities. One example of that, he wrote an opera called We Build a Town in 1930. And it was a children's opera with children as stars. The children build the town and govern it without adults. It's a lesson in civic virtues and is entertaining and appropriate for the young. <clears throat> From 1934 to 1935, he worked on his masterpiece, or one of them, Mathis der Mahler, Mathis the Painter, uh, which is based on the life of Matthias Grunewald, who's most famous for his uh, Eisenheim altarpiece in the cathedral in Eisenheim. It concerns Mathis's struggle for artistic freedom during the German Peasant War of 1524 to 1525, and it mirrors Hindemith's struggle during the Nazi repression in the 30s. And the metaphor was not lost on the Nazis because they banned his work beginning in 1936. So the premiere of this opera took place in Zurich in 1938. The first US performance incidentally was at Boston University in 1956 under the guidance of Sarah Caldwell. While he was working on this opera, he was commissioned to write a symphony the Symphony Matis der Mahler. And he took parts of what he was working on and made this symphony, which has outlived the opera really, uh, and is one of his more famous works. I'm going to play one movement from this wonderful piece. It's called the Turandot. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong, wrong work, hang on. It's the, um, it's the, Temptation of St. Francis, uh, St. Saint, Saint Anthony. It's the last movement of the symphony Matis der Mahler or Mathis the Painter. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is one of his two best known works, uh, and it was really well received by the public. As I mentioned, the Nazis banned his works in 1936. They criticized this particular piece because his other scores had been declared degenerate and Jewish connected. Uh, Hindemith's wife was part Jewish and he associated with leftists. The three movements are based on paintings or parts of paintings by Mathis Grunewald. The first is the angelic concert or concert of angels. The second movement is entombment. And then the last one, which we have just heard, is the temptation of Saint Anthony. He emigrated to Switzerland in 1938. And then, as I mentioned, he moved to Yale, accepted a professorship at Yale University in 1940 and was in, had a, probably the most productive and unfettered part of his career, of his life. Uh, he wrote in various styles, all of which are related to sort of a neo-romantic uh, kind of writing, which I think you heard there. He wrote a group of madrigals, or chansons really, after poems by Rainer Maria Rilke. As so many have, so many German composers wrote uh, songs using Rilke's texts in French. These are six chansons nach Rilke, and I will play the first one, part of is A Swan. A swan walks on the water, all surrounded by himself, like a sliding table. So at certain times, a being that we love is still a moving space. <laughs> And there are three more verses. This is the fabulous Netherlands Chamber Choir. The next is Puisque uh, tout passe, all things pass, or since all things pass. And the text, which uh, Hindemith, I think, word paints quite nicely, since everything must pass, let us sing a passing song. The one that's satisfying will be so because of us. Let us sing about whatever leaves with love and art. Let us be faster and still than that rapid departure. Short and very, very sweet, I think. Probably his most famous work is the Symphonic Metamorphosis on Themes of Karl Maria von Weber. Um, when he takes Weber's themes and transposes them and turns them around and backwards, forwards, and every which way so that they become unrecognizable. But the, the complete work, the symphonic metamorphosis is just such a fantastic piece. I'm going to play for you part of the movement titled Turn Dot or Scherzo. And you'll hear 
a wonderful opening chime and flute solo, followed by a trilling accompaniment. And then in the second section, which I will skip to, there's a rather jazzy fugal section, uh, which crescendos. And you'll be interested, I'm sure, to note that the kettle drum or timpani plays the fugal subject as well. This is the turn dot from um, Matis de Mahler. I'm sorry, from the symphonic metamorphosis. This is a great fun piece to conduct. Notice how he adds instruments to the theme and counterpoint. Lots of percussion. Rather pleasant, don't you think? Here comes the jazzy section, led by the trombone. Syncopation, rather jazzy rhythms. Fugal section. And so on. <clears throat> As I mentioned, uh, I hope I have it here, that Hindemith wrote a sonata for virtually every instrument in the orchestra. I'd like to play for you at least the opening part of the first movement of the sonata for trumpet and piano. It's entitled Mit Kraft, or With Strength. And of all the sonatas, I think this and the viola one are probably the most performed. You will hear on this recording the great Winton Marcellus, accompanied by my former colleague, Judith Lynn Stillman, on the faculty at Rhode Island College. <laughs> Hmm. 
Here we go. Etc. I was going to try to squeeze in another of Hindemith's works, but I think what I'm going to do when we do our series next season, next year, on masterpieces, I'm going to include it there. It is When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed, a Requiem for Those We Love, which Hindemith wrote in 1946 at Yale University. It was commissioned by Robert Shaw and at that time the Collegiate Chorale. I would recommend for those of you who might be entered, interested in these great large masterpieces for chorus and orchestra, go to YouTube and dial in Preparing a Masterpiece, Robert Shaw. And there you can find eight uh, videos of Mr. Shaw preparing Brahms Requiem, Beethoven Misa Solemnis, Mendelssohn, Elijah, and so on, including the When, Lives, when Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. As Mr. Shaw says in almost every one of those videos, this kind of music is music that changes people's lives. We're moving on now to the one composer who did managed to survive under the Nazis. And it's largely because he was very naive and thought music was uh, autonomous. The first three composers we talked about this evening all moved to the United States. I thought it would be interesting to give a list to you of several of the talented artists, both, both musical and otherwise, who emigrated to the United States, and a large portion of them emigrated to Los Angeles or Hollywood. Among them were Walter Gropius, the architect, Ernst Krenick, whom we already discussed, Thomas Mann, Bertolt Brecht, Billy Wilder of movie fame, Arnold Schoenberg, Igor Stravinsky, Kurt Weill, Julius Korngold, Paul Hindemith, Otto Klemperer, the conductor, and Yasha Heifetz, the great violinist. I had occasion uh, many years ago to visit the University of Southern California and their rehearsal hall is the Igor Stravinsky Hall and the violin teaching studio is the Asha Heifetz Violin Studio. The Nazis established a Reich Chamber of Culture under Josef Goebbels and it included in the Reich Music Chamber were all musicians had to belong. The first president was Richard Strauss. He was appointed and then forced to resign because his son-in-law was Jewish. I'd like to list the Nazi requirements for music, but it's impossible since all the requirements are negatives. Music must not be dissonant, atonal, 12-tone, chaotic, 
intellectual, Jewish, jazz-influenced left wing. Therefore, most modern music was excluded. And of course, the regime exploited the composers of the past, most especially Richard Wagner. The composer I'm referring to is, of course, Karl Orff, who lived a long time, 1895 to 1982. And he won international acclaim during the Nazi era, largely based on one composition uh, written in 1936 called Carmina Burana. And I'm sure many of you will recognize at least parts of this. It's a very large work for chorus, orchestra, three solos, soloists, and by large, I mean, there are two harps, two pianos, and, you know, wind instruments, as many as you can name. He, in the midst of all this huge orchestra, he set medieval poems and chants akin to Galliard songs. The Galliards were wandering poets and musicians made up of scholars and clerics. Carmina Burana means song of Boyern. And the reason it's called Carmina Burana is because these songs were found in the Benedict Boyern Monastery in Bavaria. There are over 1,000 of these songs in a mix of Latin, German, and medieval French. In this particular piece, they describe with very earthy humor the joys of tavern, nature, love, and lust. Orff set 24 of these texts in what he called a scenic cantata. By that he meant it was choreographed and meant to be danced. Uh, most performances these days take place uh, as concert pieces. I had the opportunity once to see it as a choreographed work and it is amazing. It just takes the whole thing to another level. It's much the same to me as listening to Bernstein's mass or going to see Bernstein's mass, which he called a theater piece. Uh, Orff relies on the power of the rhythm and the words. The rhythm and the melodic cells are repeated, some say ad nauseum, I would say ad infinitum, and they're not developed. Uh, music, movement, and speech were inseparable to him. It's much like Wagner's Gesamtkunstwerk. And he uses early Baroque models, and there are those who would call this a series of little Les Noces, which is the wedding, which is by Stravinsky, a bunch of little Stravinsky pieces sewn together. It remains a very, very popular work for community choruses, orchestras, professional and amateur. It's part of a trilogy, actually. <clears throat> Carmen de Burana was written in 1936. The second was Catuli Carmina. Catuli was a Roman poet. And the last, written in 1952, was the triumph of Aphrodite. Going to listen to the first few movements here. Fortune, empress of the word, world, O Fortuna, O Fortune, like the moon, you are changeable, ever waxing and waning. Hopeful life first oppresses and then soothes as fancy takes it. Poverty and power. It melts them like ice. I'm sure many of you, if not all, have heard the opening to this. It's inescapable.
That's the opening and it is also the end. In between, we have spring or primavera. In the tavern, in taberna and cur d'amour. Those are the three big sections. Uh, time is pressing on. I would like to play you from the end, the court of love, cour d'amour, the last work before the big finale. It's very beautiful, this piece. Also from the Court of Love is this text, Dulcissime, sweetest one, ah, I give myself to you totally, followed by the last piece before the repeat of the introduction, Blansifor et Elena, Ave Formosissima, hail most beautiful one, precious jewel, hail pride among virgins, glorious virgin, hail light of the world, hail rose of the world, Blanchefleur and Helen, Hail. that already. Uh, that was Seiji Ozawa, the Boston Symphony Orchestra in the New England Conservatory Chorus. I wanted to leave you with one, rec uh, one more recommendation. About this period of time in Nazi Germany, sponsored by Joseph Goebbels, 
there was a Jewish symphony or music society in virtually every major city made up of Jewish musicians. Gradually, they were eliminated one by one until only one in Berlin remained and ultimately that had to be uh, got, done away with as well. There's an excellent book by Martin Goldsmith. And if you listen to Sirius XM, Martin Goldsmith is the director of music on the weekends. The name of the book is The Inextinguishable Symphony, a story of love and music in Nazi Germany. His parents were members of the Berlin uh, Symphony, uh, Jewish Symphony. It's called The Inextinguishable Symphony, which is a title they use from a Carl Nielsen actual symphony. Martin Goldsmith's parents survived and moved to the United States. His father was a flutist. His mother was a violinist. They moved to St. Louis and his mother continued to play in the St. Louis Symphony and his father never touched the flute again. But there are those who escaped this cruelty, the Holocaust, and came to our country and made artistic lives and enriched us all. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Marquard, so much. Of course, another a terrific evening. The time just goes too quickly, actually. Uh, we learn so much and we really appreciate your insights. I hope everybody will join us uh, on June 16th when the third segment of Between the Wars will uh, examine the music of the Soviet Union. And who, Dr. Marquardt, are you going to be featuring that evening? Sergei Prokofiev and Dmitry Shostakovich. Terrific. So uh, sign up as always, as you do on the website, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at that time. Thanks so much and good night.